Thank you. Uh, okay. So, hello everybody. My name is Andre, and um, this talk will be the return of Stream.io. Let's see a little bit what is that. Uh, I am known for CycleJS, a front-end framework that I've been building for about two years now. Actually, yeah, two years. Maybe it's more. I don't know. Uh, raise hands if you have not heard of CycleJS. Okay, that's kind of a lot. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, anyway, this is not an introductory talk, okay? I'm sorry. Like, I have give, given that type of talks before. Uh, you can check it out on the internet. And this will be a talk about, like, uh, the story of how this framework came to be and its similarity to this old thing in Haskell. Okay, um, this is this type of powerful but useless talk. And, you know, just try to abstract away and try to look at the state of the art with stuff, okay? Uh, but it's still interesting to people, okay? So, uh, I work at this European digital agency called Futurize, uh, based in Helsinki, Finland. And before Futurize, before I joined Futurize, uh, I knew, like, zero about reactive programming. I ne never even heard about it. Uh, so then it was when I joined around, what, 2013 or 14, that I started to hear things such as RxJS or BaconJS or Re RxJava or reactive Cocoa, functional reactive programming. And for me, all of that was super new. I, I barely even heard of functional programming. So I started, like, researching these things, reading about it, and really got curious until I had the opportunity of uh, working on an Android project and then... I, I started that uh, with the gut feeling that I want to use RxJava and I want to use these observable stuff. And, you know, that's how I learned it the hard way, by doing it in customer projects. And uh, it was not easy. I mean, I always, sometimes I got stuck and I had this gut feeling that there has to be this reactive way of doing this. And that's how I discovered uh, how to do reactive programming. And then I also scribbled a lot on these paper notes and did a lot of marble diagrams and yeah, so that was how I learned it. And then after a few months, I wrote this introduction to reactive programming that went kind of viral. Have you heard about this, maybe? Yeah, a couple of people. Okay, that's nice. Um, you should check it out. And then after a few months, I kept on doing stuff about observables, and I released this website called Rx Marbles. It's basically just a visualization tool so you can understand how do these stuff work, these streams and their operators. And, you know, a lot of people like RX Marbles, but for me, like, there's a lot of stuff that happened in RX Marbles that was kind of background stuff. So, uh, I first wrote it in CoffeeScript and RxJS and jQuery, and then I threw away CoffeeScript, rewrote it in ECMAScript 5, and then uh, I tried to put React in it, and I was really annoyed with React, so I threw that away, and I used virtual DOM with RxJS, and then I converted to Babel, and I experimented with a ton of different architectures because I wasn't really sure how to do this. Um, because there was, like, there was no such thing as like, an architecture built around RxJS observables or streams in general for front-end and that kind of stuff. So I really did a lot of like, architecture drafts, and this is me trying to figure out stuff uh, I, I even like called it OMVC, as in observable MVC. Then I renamed it to MVI, and things were crazy. And that's how I sort of released this small, tiny library called CycleJS, and it, really, it received a lot of feedback from the open source community. And slowly, this started getting shape. And by feedback, I don't mean like, yeah, this is cool. I mean like, this is crap, you know? <laughs> and I was like... Why is it crap? I mean, how can I uncrapify it? Uh, so then I released a, a little bit of like variations, and you know, I started to like really think about this. I mean, you know, with regard to architecture, I think I redid the whole idea seven times or something like that. So it started getting less crappy, less crappy, and then you know, I, we got to this point where we got a nice architecture that people kind of appreciate using it, and they, they like it, you know, and I also like it, I feel super productive with it. Um, yeah, so a little bit after that, I think this was last year, May, 
A little bit after that, I saw this. Uh, there was Eric Meyer in some video uh, on, I think it's Channel 9 or something, where he was explaining about Haskell and stuff, and then he said, you know, in the back in the days, we used to have this thing in Haskell. And I paused the video, and I was like, wait a second, wait a second, that's what I have. That is what I have. And I was like, so it turns out that this thing I've been building is like, has already been there a long time ago. Um, so yeah, in 1998, like they wrote these papers in the university, Paul Hodak and a bunch of other amazing professors uh, were researching about you know pre-Haskell, so before Haskell came up, and that's a bit like you know how Haskell uh, uh, started taking shape. So you know I'm not going to I'm going to explain this thing called Stream.io. Okay, this thing here that Eric Meyer is talking about. But I'm not going to show you a paper here, and I'm not going to show Haskell. Uh, so, and I also don't pretend I know everything that they do, because you know, in 1989, they were there in the university re researching this stuff, while in 1989, I was just like, you know, <laughs> fooling around, just doing nonsense. So yeah, I did my own reading, and I think I know what this is about, and I want to share with you kind of like the theoretical ideas uh, behind this. So don't be afraid, you know, it's going to be rather easy. I'm not going to show Haskell or Haskell code. Okay, um, so what is Haskell and what is Stream.io? <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing funny about this slide. You guys are laughing on the wrong slides. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, so um, in short, it means that, you know, usually you have your programs have logics and effects mix it, okay? You have something like perform network request, that's an effect. And you have display pixels, that's an effect. And you have logic, like, you know, get the number, multiply it by 100. That's logic. It's just logic. So what Haskell does is separate those two. It says, like, logic, you go to one side, effects, you go to the other side. But um, there's different ways how you can separate that, okay? One way that you can separate it is with this so-called monadic I.O., the other way is called stream I.O., and the other way is called continuation I.O., and this is back from the 1989 paper. Now, it turns out that, you know, of all of these three, just monadic I.O. survived in Haskell. So we're going to quickly see monadic I.O. and stream I.O., but not continuation I.O., it's kind of out of scope. So, um, okay. I don't intend to give, like, a monad tutorial here on stage, uh, now I'm just going to give a soft intuition of what is this for people who are not familiar with it. Now, if you have ever done Haskell in your life, uh, okay, you guys, please close your eyes because I'm going to explain this in JavaScript and you're probably going to be disgusted. Okay, so yeah, just don't vomit. <laughs> so here's a program in JavaScript that uh, is really simple. Okay, it just says window confirmed. So it does this pop up like that, and you can say yes or no, and then it gets the answer, is sure. If it's sure, say console log, you are sure. If it's not sure, then you're not sure, okay? Really simple program. So I'm gonna apply a trick, because this program mixes logic and effects. So the effects are window confirm and console log, and the logic is the if and else, okay? So I'm gonna apply a trick, okay? Now, uh, my program has, like, effect one is an array with string and effect two is an array with string. And then I concatenate those two and I get an array with two strings. And that's, I output that, okay? So it's completely pure because, you know, once you call that function, you're gonna get always exactly the same arrays with strings inside them, okay? Pure, but it happens to be that the content of the string says window.confirm, um, yeah. So some of you might know what I'm gonna do next. I have this program there, this, no, this function run, which takes each of those effects strings and runs eval on it. Okay? Now you can kind of see what I'm doing there, huh? Um, yeah. And they say that you shouldn't use eval, but that's what I'm doing here. So I call the first string uh, with eval, window confirm, and it shows that effect. And then uh, with that, I get out a result. I keep store that result there and then I pass that result to the next string, I substitute the dollar sign, okay? So that's what I'm doing here, and there you go, you know? Uh, the main program only has 
data, okay? I encoded effects as data, right? Uh, it's a trick, because the string is always data. But, so the string doesn't yet do the effect, it's just like later something will get that and do that. And that's how you can separate logic from effects. Voila, there you go. That's kind of like monadic I.O. Yeah? Yeah, Haskellers, please stay in silence. Uh, now we're going to see here a different one. This is called stream I.O. It's a different way of doing the separation. Um, so logic will go into your program on the left, and effects will go to the right on the operate, in the operating system. So the way that we're going to set, like, make stuff happen in the operating system or in the real world, like window.confirm, is we're going to send a message to the operating system as if the operating system would be a server. Okay? So we're sending a request to the operating system as if it would be a server. And that request is something like, hey, please run console log for me. Okay? And then we're going to get out, uh, or like, let's say, please run window.confirm, and then we're going to get out a response as if the operating system would be a server. And that response is the sort of messages that we want to read from the outside world. Okay? That's, um, that's the trick here. So how does it look like in JavaScript? Again, Haskellers, please don't vomit. Um, let's see this in JavaScript using ES6 generators. Okay? Uh, and this just to give an intuition. So first I create there um, an object that is my request. And I, I want to run window.confirm. So my request has there the type is confirm, and the content or the value is, are you sure? And then I yield that object. In ES6 generators, you can do this. You can yield. And the way that yield works is that uh, it freezes uh, on that yield point. So you kind of yield this object to the outside world, and after that, it freezes there. And, it, and then once it gets back the response, it continues from that spot. So it will get confirm response. It kind of it's this thing that has this ability to pause and continue. So then, once you get that response from the uh, server or the operating system, you can uh, do a if and else. That's our logic, right? And then you can say, um, hey, here's a request to run the console and with that content. Else, run the console with this content. And those are also requests that we're giving, passing to the operating system. Now, the other side is the operating system. How does that work? Well, we have a function here that will call your program. And it will get the first request from the program. And it will also do that in a loop. And then it uh, checks if that request type is of console. If it's a console request, then it will perform the console. And if it's a confirm request, then it's going to perform the confirm. And it will get back the response and it will feed it back to the program like this. This is just how you do it in ES6 generators. And then we run that. So there you go. This is how we can get an intuition of what is monadic I.O. and what is stream I.O. And this is basically stream I.O., um, the diagram. So uh, here was a problem. Uh, while Eric Meyer was showing that in the video, he was like, yeah, this is stream I.O., this is how Haskell used to work. Uh, but like, then he wipes it away, and he says, but it didn't work out, so let's just forget about it. And I was like, whoa, wait a second. Like, what went wrong with stream I.O.? I mean, I was kind of disappointed. Um, so what happened? Why didn't stream I.O. work? So um, take a careful look. Um, the Haskell report on version 1.0 uh, is this uh, file there? Do you see any problem? Check the date, right? April Fools. So they put stream IO there, but it's like April Fools, huh? Gotcha. <laughs> You're supposed to laugh. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. But seriously, why didn't stream IO work? That that was I was like curious. Like, why did this thing work? Why is why is Eric Meyer wiping it away? Um, so, I went to study a bit more, and I, come, um, I saw this definition of, of reactive system and a definition of a tra transformational system. And these are old stuff, I mean, from the 90s and stuff. So, I'm not making this up. There are books about it that we completely forgot. Uh, but one of the books said there, gave the definition of a transformational system. It says, a transformational system repeatedly waits for its inputs to arrive, carries out some processing, and outputs the result when it's done. So it's basically, it gets some data, 
some file or something, it does some processing, it spits out the results, and it's done. Basic examples are like your compiler or Unix commands like move or rename, you know, all of these things, you know, basic old programs, right? So that's a transformational system. What is a reactive system? It continuously interacts with its environments using inputs and outputs that either are continuous in time or discrete. Uh, and the inputs are often asynchronous, meaning that they may arrive whenever and the outputs may go out whenever. So it's kind of like this. It's processing the whole time. And at some point, it gets an input. And maybe after two days or after two milliseconds, it sends out the output, and it keeps on going. So it doesn't necessarily stop. It's just like this. And it may, in parallel, get inputs or outputs. Examples of that are the so-called real-time systems, like these aviation control systems or user interfaces, like mobile apps or websites, front end that we're building, and servers, right? Okay. So history went like this. In the early 90s, um, basically any computer program was a transformational system. A kid asks his dad, Daddy, what is a computer program? And the dad is like, well, son, you know, it's this thing. You give a file to it in the computer, it does some stuff, and it spits out another file. And then the kid is like, OK. okay. So at that time, these were the pro uh, dominant programming languages. And those languages were made for transformational programs. I mean, obviously, because we were living in that blue world, that's what computer programs were, so the languages were made for that. So for instance, C, right? C is made for that. Look at that. Uh, we have main. It takes the arguments. It does stuff in this for loop, and it returns 0, and it dies after that. Okay? C was made for that. C comes with a main function. And also, you know, Java. Java is still one of the top three languages in the world used. And there we go. You have this main, just like in C, takes some arguments, does some processing, system.exit, zero, and it's done. It dies. So it turns out that Haskell Stream.io was uh, born out of this time. So it, 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 yeah, it's from the 90s. Now, the reasons why it didn't work is that it turns out not to be good for transformational programs. Okay? Uh, but there's many reasons. Like One of the reasons is that it was blocking, not asynchronous. Uh, it was also really easy to deadlock, and you, because you had this circular dependency between request and response. So in order to have a response, you need a request, and you need a request and a response. So it was complicated. It was kind of easy to do something like, I'm waiting for the res second response, but that relates to the first request. So if you did a, like a off by one error, then uh, things would just lock and freeze because it's blocking. And also, one of the problems of Stream.io at that time was uh, the, whenever you had a question and answer type of program, such as you know, your typical uh, first program in computer science, like, please input your age, and then it freezes. And then you input your age, get char, and then, hi, your age is this, you are young. In my case, it's like you're getting a bit old. Um, yeah, so Stream.io is a bit inconvenient for that type of uh, question and answer, this, that, this, that. Um, so, and that was the dominant type of uh, programs that we had at the time. So uh, for other reasons, it was hard to extend the types of the I.O. actions and whatever. So they started studying, and they figured out, hmm, monadic I.O. is quite good for transformational programs. So then in 1996 and onwards, they started using uh, monadic I.O. for almost everything in, in Haskell. And I think you can't even do nowadays stream I.O. in Haskell. So it's, it's left dead. And just to give you some context, you know, in 1996 and around that, it was the time when we started talking about multimedia. Just like, it's like a buzzword, you know, just like today we have Internet of Things. It was like multimedia, CD-ROM, you know? <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> you remember. <laughs> so, so, but multimedia was basically UIs, you know? So we started having Windows 95 and things like that, and, you know, we started getting the feeling for uh, UIs, and UIs are reactive programs, okay? So we were still a dominantly blue world of transformational programs, but we started having a bit of green. And in the early 2000s, the whole programming community went through very dark times because, um, you know, like 
on one hand, we had this foundation of transformational programs with like C and C++ and Java, but on the other hand, we really had to deliver these multimedia apps and we really need to get things done. And also servers started being a thing around this time. And those were dark times because if you remember, we're, we had like a ton of shared memory concurrency mixed with events and callbacks and Win32 APIs and object-oriented programming. And this was fine, you know. So, yeah, and in the front-end world around, let's say, 2004 or 5, we barely even had jQuery. And any J JavaScript app that you open from that time most likely had a lot of callbacks and mutation of global variables, and that was also fine. Yeah. But now, um, fast forward to today, 2016, and you name it, you know, we, we live in this green world where all the programs are reactive. So a kid asks his father, Daddy, what is a computer program? He might not even say computer program, he might even say app. Um, and the father says, you know, it's this thing that is on your phone or your computer, and you can interact with it, and it shows you some stuff, and you do some stuff on it, and that's it. You know? So our idea of a computer program is that it's interactive nowadays. Um, so I bet you know, any software that you have, seriously, like any of you, I could pick any of you, and like, you know, do you have something asynchronous? Uh-huh. You know, like, I could do this now, but I, yeah. S like, promises, callbacks, streams, CSP, whatever, everyone has something asynchronous. You don't even, like, question it. Uh, and I, so, like, and, and I bet that it also runs continuously, like something interactive, right? Uh, for instance, even compilers today, which are tra tra traditionally transformational programs, they are also, like, interactive. So in TypeScript, we have now this thing called a compilation server, where it's just running, and it may get source code, and check that, and produce out an output, and it's just like a server, really. So this is used in editors, for instance, Visual Studio Code, so that you know, every time anything changes in your editor, and any kind of uh, source code in your project, it will check that for you. And that's, that's an interactive program, suddenly. And in these days for concurrency, most of the stuff that we're using for uh, asynchronous and concurrency is uh, message passing. Okay, so there's two types, message passing and shared memory. And that's pretty interesting, okay? Because if, you've, if you haven't slept yet, then, uh, I mean, if you haven't slept during this presentation, then you're gonna remember that StreamIO was a message passing abstraction. And that was cool. So it was message passing, but in Haskell they also used lazy lists and um, blocking uh, programming. So um, I discovered that if you just replace lazy lists with streams and blocking with asynchronous, then StreamIO becomes very useful for um, message passing or interactive apps that we build today. And that's why I say StreamIO with quotes, because the Haskell people won't like me right now because I, I changed the lazy lists to streams. Uh, but the diagram didn't change, okay? So when I changed uh, lazy list to streams, the diagrams stay the same. I really have a program that sends out messages and receives back messages. And voila, th my, that, my friends, is the idea of PsychoJS. It's a JavaScript framework for interactive apps uh, where you have message passing, you have an input-output gate for uh, logic and effects, and you have streams for asynchronous programming. That's it. Um, let's take a quick look uh, at it. Uh, again, this is not an introductory talk, but just to give an idea in code as well. Uh, here we have some imports at the top, just to import the library and the stream library as well. And then uh, this is our program. Sources is like incoming messages from the operating system. And then I can do something like this. I can define a stream called increment stream. And that stream is all of the click events on the increment element mapped to plus one. In other words, like, if you abstract a bit, it's just, I create the stream, just think event emitter, called increment stream, and then I listen to all the click events on the increment element, and then I dispatch a plus one on the increment stream, okay? That's basically the same thing as doing map there, so, yeah. Uh, I have uh, many talks about like careful introduction to uh, PsychoJS in case you want to take a look later. So then we do almost the same thing for the decrement stream. We uh, also 
merge together the increment stream with the decrement stream. We make this so-called action stream, and it has some similarities with flux and redux. It, you can think of an action like that. And then we make a reducer stream, also kind of like in Redux, where you get each action and you map that action to a function. And that function knows how to take previous state and make new state. So then we get all the reducer functions over time, and we can fold them. This is kind of like array.reduce. Same idea as in Redux. And then we can uh, finally map each count in the count stream to a markup. And then we send that back to the DOM. So initially, from the DOM, we got messages, which were uh, events, like clicks. And now we're sending back more messages, which are markup. So from the DOM, I get clicks into my program. And back to the DOM, I send back markup of what should be shown. And then finally, we just run this. We run the program against the operating system, which is the browser. And there we go on the left, we have this program running. It just, you know, you click the, yeah, the counter app. But on the right, you see our dev tools, and they show uh, the structure of streams, okay? And you can literally see the messages being passed there, okay? And this is the idea. We have message passing not just in the, at the boundaries with the operating system, but also between your app, you can see the messages passing. Okay, so the idea is just, you have a stream of DOM events from the outside world, map that to the stream of actions, map that to the stream of reducers, map that to the stream of state, and you can send back a stream of markup. So uh, it turns out that CycleJS has asynchronous message passing. It's good for user interfaces or any kind of reactive system. And it has good separation concerns. There's another talk for that. Uh, but one thumbs down here is that it's not so good for handling question and answer type of I.O. Okay, just like stream I.O. from Haskell was not so good for a question and answer, uh, this is not so good for that either. Let's take a quick uh, look at why. So here we have a response and a request to HTTP, to a real server, okay? And first of all, I have the response defined first, and then I have the request defined later. And that's already kind of weird, right? Because usually you define request before the response. Uh, yeah, but anyway, in fact, you can actually put these in whatever order you want. So mm -hmm, that's also kind of weird. So how is this response connected to that request? And they are connected through this thing called a category or just an ID, okay? So I basically send out a request to the server, but I say, hey, that request is labeled cat category hello. And then when I get back a response from the server, I checked. I, I checked that that response has category hello, because it could be any other response. I mean, I could be making tons of different requests to different servers, and I want to know which one is that one. So uh, as you can see, I have to have some identifier here to connect these two things. But what I really wanted to do is just define I have this request, and then my response depends on this request. And then I don't need to have these hello identifiers anymore. OK, again, you don't need to understand all of these details here. It's just to say that it's not so good for question and answer type of uh, in interaction. Uh, and also, I mean, you could do this. You could do this. But now we're mixing effects with logic. We're doing the network request inside our program. And you know that has its problems. So, does that mean that Stream.io has this inherent problem that question and answer type of inter interaction is, is bad? Well, not really. There's another I.O. model uh, that comes very close to Stream.io, and that's Elm and the Elm architecture. And it's also uh, message-driven, just like you know, it has, sends out messages, literally has a message type, and you receive back, uh, no, I'm sorry, you receive messages from the operating system, and you send out commands. Yeah. So what's different about Elm? Does it solve this question and answer type of thing? Well, kind of yes. It has a thing called task. Okay. And what is a task in Elm? It's basically a command or, or a request that your program is sending to the uh, runtime or the operating system. But this message is quite big. It says, like, you know, I want you to do this, go there and get that and do this, and then that, do that, and then do this, and then finally you get the result and give it back to me. Okay? So it's not like a very tiny request, like run console log. It's like do a lot of stuff. And then you get back the result. 
So again, just pretend that you know Elm like, like an advanced user already. And here we have a task, which is like first HTTP GET from that URL, and then uh, pick out all the IDs from all of these hats. And then for each hat, I want you to run an HTTP POST to like that hat. Okay, so we're doing many requests here, but this is just one task. Now, uh, you might not know Elm, but this is just data. It doesn't perform that task. It's not like a promise. You could imagine that this is just a string. Okay, This whole thing is just a string saying, please do that, do this, and do this, and do that. It's just data. And if you've been paying attention, this is monadic I.O. Uh -huh, that's kind of interesting. Right? So instead of using strings, like you know, Elm has these data structures called tasks. So that's kind of funky because you can put monadic I.O. inside stream I.O. So a task is really like monadic I.O. It's just like you're sending out this message, please run this bunch of instructions. And that can run inside the context of this string, of this thing called stream I.O. So it turns out that we can have transformational programs inside reactive programs. And that's pretty cool. So message passing is awesome. Uh, because it doesn't rule out monadic I.O. You can do b both. Uh, and if you squint, you know, it's like, eh. maybe you can see message passing in Flux and Redux as well. Because, uh, uh, you know, you have your store, and that has stuff inside it, and you send back messages, which are uh, state objects, to your tree of components. And then your tree of components eventually sends messages back to your store. And those me messages are actions. So there we go. We have messages of state and messages of actions. And unidirectional, right? That's where this stuff, that's where the name kind of comes from. Uh, but Redux and Flux are not purely functional because they don't try to do the separation of logic and effects. So you could do logic and effects inside the store. You could do logic and effects inside the components. Um, yeah, so you can mix them as you wish. So that start ma started making me wondering, does message passing plus a purely functional approach mean something like Stream.io with quotes? Um, yeah, so, you know, because Flux misses the purely functional part, so it's not exactly Stream.io, it's just unidirectional data flow. But, you know, I find it quite hard to have those two elements of message passing and purely functional and not end up with something like Stream.io with quotes. So my conclusion is we live in a world where all of the programs are reactive programs, okay? Uh, languages have a lot of heavy inertia, okay? They take a lot of time to evolve and, be, and get adopted. Uh, so in the 1990s, like, uh, the languages that we use were actually created 10 or 20 years before, like in the 70s. And the languages that we used in 2010, like JavaScript and Ruby and Java, they were created also about 10 years before. So the trick is, if you want to know quite accurately what are we going to use in the next five years, you need to look at the languages that are quite promising right now, because you know, languages take a lot of time to be adopted. So uh, just to list a few, OK? This is not an exhaustive list. Elm, Elixir, Clojure, Dart. Um, and all of these languages mentioned, I mean, there's a bunch of others, uh, have a focus on these uh, things they already assume asynchronous. They're not going to be like, uh, they're not going to ignore this, this part. They, they take asynchronous seriously. So Clojure has like core async that takes uh, async quite seriously with uh, CSP. Elixir as well it has an Erlang style action um, uh, model. I'm not going to pretend I know that. Elm, as we saw, has also message passing and a focus on asynchronous programming. And Dart, you know, it has a beautiful uh, API for streams that looks like RxJS. You should take a look. Dart is usually not mentioned, but uh, just in case you're interested in sort of like ideas and stuff, just take a look at how async is in Dart, much better than JavaScript. So uh, and there's also a trend nowadays towards uh, functional programming. So Elm, Elixir, Clojure have like a focus on functional programming. Okay. So we can kind of know that the future is going to be something like this. In front end, the situation is like this today. Okay, PsychoJS uses message passing. React and Redux, message passing. Elm, message passing. Vue.js with its uh, Flux-like, Vuex, uses message passing. Angular 1 with its scope, you know, that was shared memory concurrency. 
Angular 2 has, you know, almost the same thing as shared memory concurrency, but then you have NGRX, which is made for Angular 2, and getting ideas from Redux, it's also message passing. So there's a strong ter tendency towards using message passing um, concurrency. And then also, uh, when it comes to paradigms, PsychoJS wants to be functional, like, yeah, and Redux and React is like, yeah, I want to be functional. Uh, Elm is like functional, sunglasses. Um, <laughs> Vue.js is object-oriented programming. Angular 1 and 2 are object-oriented programming. NGRX is like, yeah, I want to be functional. So there we go, yeah. Uh, that's why we can rather confidently say or predict that in the next few years, programming and front-end programming will be mainly purely functional, event-driven, and uh, message-passing concurrency. Thank you so much for listening, and yeah. Oh. So, thanks. We have some questions from the app. Um, why not use closure script with core async? You can use. <laughs> Go ahead. Why not? <laughs> yeah. uh, sometimes people ask me, "What do I think? Of, what do I think about closure?" And I, I have to answer, "I have no idea because I, I haven't used closure. I mean, I used closure maybe for five hours or something like that. And um, what I have of opinion of closure is what I called unqualified opinion. It means that I, I don't know anything about it, so you shouldn't even listen to me, you know? So don't listen to people who haven't ever used stuff, and I don't know. It's probably good. I don't know. Okay. Another one. Um, how do we prevent developers from creating their own effects without, without using Cycle? How to prevent developers from using, uh, writing their own effects? From creating their own effects without Cycle. Uh, I, I guess the question... It's kind of like, how can I enforce that people are not making uh, effects in uh, JavaScript and PsychoJS? You can't, like, really enforce. There's, there, there's an interesting ESLint plugin or preset that Bodil Stokes uh, helped put together that basically makes JavaScript like, you know, you can't use mutation, you can't use anything. Um, and that's an interesting way. Maybe you could use that. I, ha I have used that with PsychoJS and basically... Yeah, that kind of works. It's one way of enforcing, but the idea is really uh, doing this, like having some discipline. Um, and then, like, maybe I can say a little bit more that, like, I have played with the thought of writing a language that would be optimized for PsychoJS. Just like, you know, we have Elm and we have a bunch of different lang languages that compile the JavaScript, but it takes so much time. Seriously, you can't imagine how much commitment writing a language takes. So I don't think I would jump into doing that. But in an alternate universe, I could maybe do that. Great. Um, have you discussed this with Eric Meyer? Uh, no. So the thing is, like, I met Eric Meyer in person, um, let's say month one. And then uh, after, in month seven, I discovered about Stream.io. So I, I didn't have time to talk to him. but. He knows that I like to make like analogies between the stuff, but I think the key there with Stream.io is that it was blocking and it was lazy lists. So we changed those two parts and now it's asynchronous and stream. So that makes a big difference, I think. Good. Um, how is bind or flat map implemented? Bind or flat map implemented? Mm, there's like, I, I have to assume many things. Well. Um, bind, well, I, I, I guess the question is about bind or flat map in the hacky JavaScript monadic I.O. that I talked about, but maybe this is a question that you can ask me in person. It's basically, yeah, let's yeah. talk about that. Uh, yeah? Is Haskell not a good language for reactive UI since it's using monadic I.O.? Again, I'm going to play that card. I have, card, I have no <laughs> idea. Because okay. I haven't used Haskell for um, UIs. Uh, barely use Haskell for almost anything. I'm still learning like, how to actually use it. Um, but I know that Haskell has cool stuff like Fran, 
which is a functional reactive programming uh, library. And this was also like, there's a ton of work that related to functional reactive programming that was done by Paul Hudak, who's one of the main people behind Haskell. And those kind of things, um, functional reactive programming is mainly for user interfaces. So it's mainly for like reactive programs. So I'm sh quite sure that Haskell has really nice stuff for that. Good. Um, are you planning to migrate the code to TypeScript? And can we use it with Angular 2? Uh, can we use Cycle with Angular 2, or can we use TypeScript with Angular 2? I think they mean Cycle. Okay, well, uh, don't use Angular with Cycle. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. But you are migrating the code to TypeScript. Yeah, yeah, please use TypeScript. I mean, you're going to thank yourself. It's really nice. I mean, um, so people think that there's a lot of, um, like, like, like things that you need to do in order to use TypeScript. But in reality, let's say you can't get the typings for some library. You can just say like, you can type this as any, and then you're back to the level of quality of JavaScript, right? Because in JavaScript, everything is typed as any. So it's like, by adopting it, you any way will have some benefit. Because in code, like let's say you get a response back from the server, that thing is usually typed. I mean, right, it has some fields that you expect to be there. There's so much stuff you can benefit just by using a little bit of TypeScript. And it's even possible that you use some files in your project are JavaScript, some files are TypeScript. But you know, this is a whole separate talk. Good. Um, let me see. Why Elm and Cycle.js compare to TypeScript or ECMAScript 6 with ReactiveJS? Okay, um, um, why Elm with TypeScript, what? No, Elm and Cycle.js compared to TypeScript with ReactiveJS. Ah, okay. I think the question is how does Elm compare to TypeScript like when you're using Cycle with TypeScript? Elm will be much better, obviously. It's a purely functional programming language. Um, but, you know, TypeScript is better than JavaScript. That's why we started using TypeScript. But you can also use JavaScript if you want. Um, but definitely, a language like Elm will be uh, much better in this regard. I mean, you're going to have that uh, confidence of zero runtime errors, while with TypeScript, you have this confidence of, like, much less runtime errors than JavaScript, but still some runtime errors. Thanks again. Thank you.